to another one of our DAT In Focus interview series. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics at DAT, and this week we're going to be covering a really hot topic among our listeners and viewers, flatbeds. So to help cover this topic, I brought in two experts who are actually right down the road from me. I have Jason Frederick, VP of Operations at Miller Transfer, and Dave Cochran, VP of Sales and Marketing, right, mm -hmm. at Miller Transfer. Welcome, guys. Hey, thanks a lot, Ken, and thank you so much for having us. We're really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. So maybe some brief introductions of what you guys do in your day-to-day -day roles before we get into things. Jason? Sure, absolutely. Again, my name is Jason Frederick, Vice President of Operations, and uh, I've been with Miller Transfer about a year and a half now and have 29 years in the industry, all the way from LTL to expediting. So the last year and a half, learning the, the flatbed side and the specialized hauling has been uh, very intriguing and interesting and uh, thrilling every day. There's there's no days that are the same, so it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Dave? Because I'm older, um, <laughs> I've been in the trucking industry for about 35 years, so uh, that's this year, which is amazing. Most of it was in the van, LTL world, and expediting world, so we have a lot of commonality. We actually yeah. both started at Roadway Express back oh, in the day. It's a huge kind of, in our area, right? Express Roadway and then Roadway and Yellow Merge, so yeah. we have a lot of Roadway folks right. in our so area. I, I decided to uh, make a change to Miller about eight years ago, and uh, so I've seen a lot of changes over the course of that. And honestly, I've had the most fun in this industry out of any transportation mode that I've been in. Uh, specialty transportation is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited to get into it. And there's some some connections here. You're from the Pittsburgh area originally, right? Actually, no, I lived there twice. Oh, okay, but you're not uh, you're not a born yet. <laughs> I'm here. a Browns fan. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's too late to uninvite you to this. Uh, I and lived Jason, in North Hill in Zealand, okay. And uh, so Jason was a uh, VP in my prior role at FedEx, and um, just really kind of inspirational leadership. So I wanted to thank you for that, and that's one of the why you're one of the first people I thought of to bring in for this series. Oh, that's awesome. Um, thank you, Ken. And again, you're only as good as the people around you, yeah, and uh, sure. you made me look really good, so thank you for that, sir. Yeah, the numbers behind it, right? So I want to dive right in, and if you guys can just tell me a bit about Miller Transfer, for those not familiar, what do you sure. guys do, um, and, and how do you help your customers? Mm -hmm. Miller Transfer's been around for over 50 years, and uh, we're an asset-based specialty carrier that's focused on open deck transportation. So we can do anything from a legal flatbed all the way up to over-dimensional heavy shipments up to 400,000 pounds. So we, uh, we haul some pretty interesting things. We have locations throughout the U.S. Um, many are port related because of the business that we yeah. do do. Uh, we handle U.S., Canada, Mexico, and we also offer crating, wrapping, warehousing, and project management services. So you guys a contract fleet, or employee, a mix? A mixture. Actually, oh. uh, you know, probably about 80% on the independent contractor side and 20% employee drivers. Now, the employee drivers typically handle a lot of the heavy haul shipments that Dave was just talking about. You know, the, the 200, 300,000 pound shipments, uh, multi-axle type trailers, things of that nature. And then our independent contractors handle a lot of what we call legal loads, things that are less than 60,000 pounds, uh, you know, under 13 feet high, 14 feet wide. That's what they really focus on. So it's a good mixture and it's neat to have both of them in the model because it's hel it helps us be competitive in the marketplace right. for one, but it also allows different opportunities for drivers because some drivers do want to be employee drivers, some want to be independent contractors, and we have both of those opportunities. And you guys have the blue the blue trucks, right? And if I see yes. like on you post on LinkedIn or something with like the crazy sure. multi axle yeah. things, those are the blue trucks that are Miller Transfer. Yeah, our right? company uh, equipment is all blue. Yeah, um, and then there's a Miller logo on the IC's uh, truck, but they could be any color. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So you guys teed it up a little bit, but I want to move into our first real question that we get a lot, and that's if I'm driving a dry box, and I'm real familiar with that, what are some of the key ways that flatbed differs from a refrigerator or your kind of typical dry box transport? Yeah, certainly. Uh, just a couple things, and I know Dave will chime in on this one as well, but you know, typically with your, your dry van and your reefer business, uh, you know, 48, 53 foot trailers, and certainly you have the weight restrictions in there that you got to make sure you're not overloading the trailer. They're covered up, you know, roll on, roll off, so to speak. When you get into the flatbed side of things, I mean, you really have to pay attention to how high is the load, how wide is the load, how much weight's on there, because you gotta load it accordingly to the center of gravity a lot of times. There's tarping involved uh, with several of the shipments. And, you know, depending on the size of it and the state, 
permits come involved with different things. You don't need a lot of that with the dry van and reefer type business. It's pretty much, you know, shipper just loads it, you get it in there, you secure it, and you, you head down the road. But a lot goes into moving a flatbed or a special size load uh, in the industry. And you've got so many different kinds of trailers. It's That's the big thing. Flatbed. Yeah. We deal with that at DAT, right? Because I look at the data and I see if van's a van. Right. And I'm trying to work with my team. And they're like, what's the difference between a Conestoga, a double drop? Like, I see 10, 12 different equipment types oh, yeah. for flatbed. I mean, you've got step decks. You've got double drops out yep. there. You have Conestoga step decks. You have a Conestoga flat. I mean, there are so many different kind of trailers out there. Let alone stretch trailers. I mean, you have flatbeds that can stretch and you've got low boys that can stretch. Uh, I mean, you can haul 75 feet of something uh, in a low boy trailer or even a flatbed. I mean, it's amazing what the trailers and the dynamics a different trailer brings to the market. Like a windmill blade, right? I mean, you see those things going down to those big windmills. Yeah, it's it's interesting. The, that type of equipment is very specific. So we don't haul windmills, uh, mm -hmm. actually, but we haul the nacellas and, and other components oh. of the wind industry. Uh, because that's a single-use piece of equipment, we can we can haul the heavier stuff on our own equipment right. okay. uh, without doing the blades. But um, that's that's cool. So that kind of brings us right into our next question that we get a ton is like, well, if I have a 53 footer, sometimes it's just FAK back there mm -hmm. of the dry box, right? But I have to imagine flatbed's very commodity specific, like we just talked about. But can you maybe give listeners a, a couple more examples of how different commodities are different sets of problems for for you guys? Yeah, sure. absolutely. So if if you think about the things that we need to capture, we call it our proven process. We capture information right up front, uh, dims the weight, um, get technical drawings and things like that, because it's very important that we understand the center of gravity, as Jason said, and knowing how we are going to load it on a trailer. The, uh, the things that we haul, we can haul almost anything on an open deck, but we really don't focus a whole lot on steel, uh, raw steel and pipe and lumber and things like that. We focus on things that are more, they have a need for a higher level of security, a higher level of service. Mm -hmm. um, so really, if I break down my business, our business in a, in a couple of different industry segments, industrial machinery would be a very large piece. Okay. Um, there are a lot of different aspects of industrial machinery. Number one, it comes in all shapes and sizes and weights. Um, they're all used for different reasons. They're going into new places or old places. There's, there's a lot of nuance to it. Also, you have to be coordinated with riggers, uh, construction site schedules, plant schedules, and things like that. So timing is really of the essence. Another piece of our business that we do is uh, large fabrications, which uh, can be big and beautiful, high, wide, or heavy. They could be all three. Things like um, power control buildings, large fabrications like skidded systems and uh, tanks and vessels and things like that. Those have specific uh, issues uh, that need to be fixed or need to be handled based on uh, the size, permitting issues, routing issues, and things like that. Yeah, uh, so uh, inspirational. another inspirational leadership figure in my career was uh, Michael Ducker, who was throughout, you know Michael, yep. throughout all of FedEx, and he used to say, we sell pace and space. <laughs> and that's really not the case with you guys, right? You're selling all of these services to help um, customers, and that's really kind of pivots us to the next topic, which is how often do you find yourselves educating the customers more than a typical, you know, commodity hauler about what they're shipping and what they need? From mm -hmm. from our past experience, as you can yeah. imagine, it is quite a bit different. So, yeah. number one, the need for all that information up front. It's very important so we can develop the right solution and handle it right. If there's if the weight's off, if uh, the center of gravity isn't identified right. in the beginning, things can go bad pretty quickly. Right. So that's something completely different than the van world. And if you're not experienced doing that, you don't want to find that out when you're going to get scaled. That's right. That you're all out of whack or something like that. You need. It's important to understand when you're taking the shipment details down. Absolutely. What's going to be needed. And those can, are all oh, key for for the simple fact of you know if you've got a shipment that's you know overly wide or overly tall. You have to run route surveys. I mean, you literally have to go and run the route that you're going to be on that you're permitted for to make sure, okay, there are overhead lines, are there light poles, are there stoplights, whatever it is. If you're going to make a turn, are there stop signs that could have to be removed or are there tree limbs you got to cut down? All of those things have to come into play to make sure providing a great service to the customer. That's something I never, I mean, it's not just running it in PC Miler, like we're used to back in the day, for all of us, right back in the day, or uh, Rand McNally, it's a, it's a lot more complex. Yeah, that's really cool. I never even would have even thought of that. I mean, you see kind of on the internet these 
people who like aren't in trucking, you see like the tweets of the same bridge has been hit like six yeah, times. Yeah. You don't want that with a 70 foot, <laughs> you know. You never want that. You never want it for sure, yeah. Right. But The center of gravity, it seems to come into play a lot. And we do a lot of power control buildings. And mm -hmm. these are giant buildings that have switch gear on, typically on one side, but they might have it on both. So if you have a 19 foot wide power control building, you know, the builder, if they're not savvy, which most of them are, but some of them aren't, um, they're thinking in the middle of the building. Well, it actually, at 19 feet wide, on the trailer is gonna be more like 30 feet wide yeah, because mm -hmm. you have to move it to the side so it has a center uh, to the trailer. Yeah, all things you just never think of when you're putting pallets in the back of a dry box right. or loading up vegetables in a reefer. Right. Totally different. And again, the tarping comes into play to make sure the shipment is you know, taken care of. Um, you know, We do a lot with jet engines mm -hmm. and it's pretty neat because when those things are coming off the line, it's not only making sure you take care of it, but it's also the expediting of making sure it gets to where it needs yeah. to go. And taking care of shipments like that, it's a lot of fun. A lot goes into it, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, we, we both sort of made the jump from a little bit of specialty, right, where it was a little kind of interesting, whether it was vaccines or tyrannosauruses or, you know, polar yeah. bears. But <laughs> I have to imagine this is a little more complicated in some ways and probably the same in others, for it sure. Is. A lot of fun. And, it, and it's, again, transportation. People always think transportation can be easy, but there's a lot of details that go into it. And, and I've seen more of that. In, in the role that I'm in and with a specialized carrier like this, again, the permitting and the route surveys and making sure everything is like I's dotted, T's crossed, you got to do that because if you don't, you run the risk of a lot of you know potential fines, service to customers, I mean, damage to property. Yeah. There's a lot of things that come into play. I think it's boring too, and they've clearly never worked a day on the ops floor or went to an ops <laughs> meeting. <It's> like, <laughs> I've never had a boring day in the entire time I've been oh. in transportation. Oh. Even when things are like, it's a 70 degree day in Northeast Ohio, there's something somewhere going on that requires Trucking gets attention. into your blood. It, it does. does. Yeah. It does. I thought it was gonna be boring. I left the power industry locally, right? right? And, which would have been cool. I mean, I, I knew a little bit more about what it was going on in Texas, but but you know, I wouldn't trade. I mean, you, I learn something new every day. So it's it's really a cool fun field. Um, so pivoting a bit, right? We I, I look at things through a data and analytics lens. I actually came and visited you guys right before, right as COVID was going down, and talked a little bit about data and analytics and DAT. How do you guys bring that data flavor into what seems like a more hands-on? type of business. Yeah, and, and I got to tell you, Ken, thank you so much. I was glad we connected and you yeah. came in and talked to us last year because one of the things that we struggle with as a company is how do you how do you price accordingly? Yeah. And there's so many shifts in the market, um, you know, yeah. time of year, what's going on? And we really leverage that to find out what's going on in the marketplace across the entire country. So that's one. We look and say, okay, how do we leverage DAT's information for our own internal pricing? How do we make good decisions? We also leverage that from a capacity standpoint. Uh, you know, how do we get our trucks that are available out there to kind of match up with what other customers may have with loads? And then also what loads are out there and how can we match up our trucks with them? Because keeping the trucks moving is critical for profitability, not only for the independent contractor, but also for a company. You want to reduce your empty miles. So those are the three key ways that we really leverage that and uh, we appreciate our relationship and what you guys have helped us do and, and where you've helped us develop our pricing to get more strategic. And uh, because again, we'd have the same price all year long, yeah. where now we're able to kind of leverage that, talk to you guys, get information and say, okay, here's what we're seeing in the marketplace. This lane is changing and here's why it's changing. Produce season. Yeah. I mean, you name it, it all comes into play with us now. Yeah. I was going to ask, do you guys see like competing resources? Like we saw the lumber go crazy. And I know you mentioned you're not hauling a lot of lumber. Did you see prices on some of your stuff go up as kind of like a rising tides phenomenon sure. or? Uh, oil and gas is a prime example. Yeah. In key markets where oil and gas is heavy, um, that resource is typically a little less expensive. So um, when that lowered, there were a lot of trucks available and our pricing went down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one one aspect. The other, the other would just be the, the fact that uh, business as a whole has gone down a little bit over the course of last year. And it, it did drive our pricing down. I, using that uh, as a resource for us has been really good because yeah. Miller really does capture everything. We capture data on everything, yeah. but you really have to have a reverence for data and you have to be able to use it to your advantage, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so, so for sure. We capture all this data and uh, in eight years, we've really gotten good at pulling that data together and using it to our advantage. With that combined with our data, 
we're making better decisions. The best thing we can come into, and I, I think we even had some folks on my team work with uh, some folks on your team and yeah. built some like dashboards and help you guys out. We do that a lot because I'm really interested in my role and my team in their roles and like understanding. We have PhDs in microbiology, right. right? That we hire out of their PhD program or data science boot camps. They've seen trucks drive down the road, and that's about it. The best way we can get practical experience of like what's actually going on is to work. And I, I love when I go in and, and find a data pack rat because if you're like, I just installed a TM mess last year and I don't save any of that data, I, I let it dump out after 30 days, I'm like, no, <laughs> no. Because I want to see how you guys behaved in relation to the last polar vortex in 14, sure. or the industrial recession of 16, and all those things, and it's really crucial to keep that. Yeah. Um, I did have another question uh, that just came up, and I don't mean to put you guys on the spot, but do you guys need to find a lot of backhauls, or are you interested in finding backhauls after you haul one of these specialty shipments? Is that something that you're, you're thinking about? Certainly. We're always looking to find ways to keep the trucks loaded the best we possibly can. Now, again, as Dave mentioned before, we're not big into hauling the steel and the pipe and, and the lumber. If we have to do it at a certain point to move a truck, we'll do that. But we really like to get into loads that really fit in our niche. So, you know, keeping those wheels moving, however we got to do it, that is really key. Yeah, you're not going to put a bunch of cabbage or right, yeah, <laughs> reams right. of paper on the back of a flatbed. Right. On the heavy haul side, uh, these more complex moves, uh, if we can, and it fits into the total scheduling, we do. Uh, yeah. But many times it doesn't work out that way, just just based on the fact that schedules are a little bit different. Yeah. And you got to get the equipment to where it needs That's to be. Right. I'm sure from like an ops engineering perspective, there's you guys will always run a higher amount of empty miles than an FAK commodity carrier. We will. Right. You're just yeah. trying to still get down to the the least amount you can run. Correct. Correct. All right. And cool. and really an area we focus on is with our independent contractors, mm -hmm. with what we call the legal loads, the you know the less than sixty thousand and stuff, because you have more variety to pick from. The multi axle loads, those are ones. Yeah, we run typically more empty miles with those and we'd love to fill them but we know that that type of equipment is tougher if we can run them round and round oh, it'd be great you know it's, it's great but <laughs> it doesn't always happen talking about i'm not going to mention their name they'd come in the new driver training class take a penny out of their pocket and put it on the table and say we run a million of those a year if i can save you know if i can save a penny i will Absolutely. That's like, uh, trucking such a scale-based industry sure. what i'm going to tee up next is the single most popular question we get we get what we got two this morning we get it every week I'm looking to get into trucking, should I go into flatbeds first? And um, not to put you guys on the spot to answer that question, but one, do you see a lot of first-time drivers looking at flatbeds? And two, um, how, you know, how do you walk a potential carrier or employee driver through um, the ins and outs of life as a flatbed driver? So however you guys want to tackle that. Yeah, I'll jump in and then Dave mm -hmm. certainly jump sure. in as well. You've been doing it longer than I have. But what I have seen, uh, at least with Miller Transfer, so our requirements coming in, we'd like somebody to have a, a CDL for at least two years and at least one year in the past five of driving with flatbed experience. Okay, that's that's the number one coming in. Now with our heavy haul drivers, because they're pulling multi-axles, typically somebody's not gonna come in right off the street and get into that realm. We're looking for more experience there and typically it'll come from another company. But we do try to groom our independent contractors to eventually be employee drivers if they choose to take that avenue. Uh, but there's a ton of opportunity, a ton of potential, I will tell you, uh, especially at Miller Transfer. We're in the process right now of looking for independent contractors and employee drivers both. And again, we're looking for world-class drivers. Um, you can certainly, there are drivers out there that are great, you know, heartbeat behind the steering wheel and stuff like that, we are looking for the best of the best to be with our company. Uh, to help us grow, our safety standards are high, we wanna continue that. And again, we've got customers to service out there, so we need world-class drivers each and every day behind the wheel for us. And and living, living what we call the Miller Promise, and that's uh, every experience exceptional. Love that, yeah. So it sounds like one of the key takeaways is if you're looking to get into some of the more specialized, maybe you spend a year or two hauling the steel or the lumber with like a private fleet or you know as a, as a lessee, lessee on with a, a firm that does that kind of stuff and then maybe think to graduate into kind of some of the specialized stuff would be good advice. A lot of folks don't recognize up front that it's different. It's, it's a lot different yeah. and uh, just tarping and lifting tarps over your head. Uh, we have a lot of folks that invest in Conestoga retractable tarping systems as they get older because tarping is quite tough and mm -hmm. uh, so the jobs are a little bit harder they're, they're a little more high profile mm -hmm. and some folks don't realize that up front and maybe they won't like it when they get into it 
We offer that as kind of like a hand wavy caution because I've heard that, so I paired it back when we get the questions. But I mean, it's true. I mean, if you're driving by a rest site, pull up area, and it's snowing like it's been, yeah. and you see someone out there, you know, just making sure the load's secured. I mean, those are things that, um, I mean, it's tough. It's a lot tougher than, you know, laying down every, you know, 10, 10 to 14 hours and, mm -hmm. and, and dropping and hooking, right? Right. Yep. And it is or, no, roughly about 65 to 70 percent of our freight is tarping. And again, if you've got a Conestoga, that's great too. But um, not everything fits in a Conestoga. That's right. So, it doesn't. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, we do a lot of uh, industrial machinery trade shows. So mm -hmm. part of the COVID thing last year, not only did people not buy a lot of equipment, as much equipment as they did in previous years, but the trade shows were all canceled. Yeah. So that was an impact of COVID. But when you go to those shows and you're watching us load these trailers. And for IMTS, for example, we'll do 400 loads in and out. And the machines yeah. are of all sizes and shapes. We actually rent uh, lifts and things to help the drivers to get these tarps over top of it. It's quite a, a, an ordeal uh, to yeah. get it done right. Um, so I think maybe some people just don't realize that it's that kind of work. That's yeah. true. And, you know, now the big thing with this, Ken, is we compensate our drivers, both employee drivers and independent contractors very well. And the reason we do that, if they are not successful, the company is not oh, successful. Sure, yeah. I mean, that is the lifeline of us, right? They see the customers more than anybody out there. So we make sure that we take care of our, our independent contractors and our employee drivers with very good pay. Yeah. And again, you know, it's one of those things if I'm if I'm driving on the road, you know, hauling refrigerated freight, it's been very busy the past couple of weeks with the protect from freeze, right? A lot of these reefer carriers are getting engaged early. I think it's like a natural progression. You might start like it's an employee driver or something like that, um, owner operator in the dry box side, you progress into reefer because it's a little bit more requirement driven. Right. Um, and then I think the old, what a lot of people work towards is is you know getting to those higher paying flatbed jobs, um, but they don't realize that you know there, there's the physical aspect of it, there's the, do your shipments tend to be longer or are they more like, is there no real correlation between that? It, honestly, it runs the gamut. Runs the it's, gamut. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's funny. We do things like I mentioned, industrial machinery and power control buildings, right. but we also do the jet engines that, that, yep. uh, that Jason mentioned. We'll do reactor coolant pumps for the nuclear industry. Oh, we'll cool. do giant transformers. We'll do large artwork, uh, Antique trains. Yeah. We did the uh, Detroit Tiger uh, statues on their stadium. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And when the Wrigley sign needed to be uh, retrofit with new light bulbs and all that, we hauled it away and hauled it back. Oh, that's awesome. So we also moved a sign for uh, the Brown Stadium, didn't we, or something like we, that? We moved some Brown stuff. Yeah. We also moved a yeah. giant I love that guitar. One cargo <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. We moved a giant guitar for the Hard Rock Cafe in Atlantic yeah. City. So some really cool things that we have. Yeah. Those are the things that like just morale boosts. So oh, yeah. Yes. The driver pulling great it. Pictures from yeah, it's pretty <laughs> neat. Last piece on the driver's side, a lot of our independent contractors, you know, they come with their own power unit and they have the choice either to pull one of our trailers or if they've got their own trailer, they're welcome to do yeah. that. And then with our employee drivers, all the tractors are company owned, uh, four axle tractors. Now they have a sleeper unit in it, but one of the great perks that we have, we always encourage our drivers don't sleep in the truck get a hotel. That's nice. And we reimburse them. We pay for the hotel so that they're fresh, able to run the next day, the whole nine yards. And the other, you know, really interesting thing is when you think of transportation and trucking, you think a lot of stuff moves during the night. Pretty much all of our stuff moves during the day because oh, you can only travel during daylight hours with these heavy type loads. Huh. So that's another really great tip. Day shift hours. And yeah, yeah absolutely. That's awesome. A lot of folks, I mean, I would have never thought about that. Yeah. Back to kind of more general news story, right? We're going to be talking about 2020, probably long into 21. <laughs> you know, how did um, both from a business perspective and sort of a macro expect, uh, perspective, how did COVID in 2020 impact you guys at Miller Transfer? Was there something that happened in 2020? Yeah. <laughs> 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 the Browns were we're in the playoffs. That's great. Uh, certainly, uh, COVID impacted transportation yeah. overall. Yeah. And then you add the social and political unrest. There's all sorts of things that were going on uh, in the world last year. In the very beginning, we have a really good team. And in the beginning, we decided to make decisions around keeping our people safe, but not impacting our customer satisfaction. We wanted to remain fully operational. And I'm very proud of our team that we were able to do that throughout the year. We started by having people work from home right after you visited yeah, us. Yeah, I think it was a um, bad day. Yeah, it was. It might have been your fault. And, uh, oh, geez. Uh, the, uh, we provide them all the, the equipment and the setup and just guidance to, uh, to keep themselves safe and, and to service the customer. We did that for probably three months fully, and then we started to bring people back in. We do all the social distancing and masking and all that. Um, 
but it, it, it was tough. And the beginning of the year was slow. But I tell you what, our team came to the mark and we finished the year very, very strong mm -hmm. considering. Yeah, I mean, we hear that story a lot. I mean, April and May were just like this crazy up and down, yeah. uh, especially if you were hauling more commodity type stuff, sure. supermarket shelves. And then it got, I mean, there were protests on May 10th in front of the White House because rates fell through an all time low. Um, and then, like you mentioned, the second half of the year went nuts. Yeah. Yeah. December was one of the strongest months of the, yeah, it was of our, the year. Yeah. Third, third strongest December in the history of the company. Wow. So that was fantastic. And the other thing that we really did during this time frame, we invested in our people, technology and our equipment. We invested more in our equipment than we had in the history of the company. And fully looking at this is type of things we need to do to make sure we are ready to go 2021 when things break loose, because it's going to happen. Oh, yeah, especially industrials. Yeah, it's going it's to happen. This going to be, yeah, I think we'll be, this will be the year the industrials coming back. Absolutely. So we made great investments. Again, people, technology, and our equipment, and uh, we are primed to take advantage of everything and, and have a successful 2021. Yeah, that's, that's that's great to hear. I mean, we're even seeing the oil patch, right, with the uh, with diesel prices. I mean, and it's a double-edged sword, right, with yeah. uh, especially smaller carriers. They tend to bear the brunt when oil prices go up and right. diesel goes up. But it just generally sparks that economy it on does. the Bakken Shale, Utica, Marcellus regions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been it's been wild. It's like what then the storm. All right, rates were coming down and things yeah. were cooling yeah. off, and then all of a sudden it's like, woof, we saw rates do a 180 practically. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just, just in the last couple of weeks in Texas, uh, as a prime example, they were uh, doing pretty well, and then things just stopped, right? right. So uh, it's been an interesting year so far also. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like that, the sequel. It is. <laughs> it's the sequel, it is. yeah. You're yeah right. And then you have the tightness of capacity, right? So things yeah. start to take off, but then, again, it's easy to forget about the drivers that are out there, and they have to take care of their health too. Oh, I mean, the, sure. They're driving all over the country, going in truck stops, seeing multiple customers. So there's a lot of things that come into consideration for them. I mean, you know, you watch pro sports and a lot of people are opting out for the season. Mm -hmm. Well, it's pretty difficult for drivers yeah. to opt out for the season. Yeah, right? you know? I tried to ask DAT to opt out, but it didn't <laughs> work, didn't work too well. <laughs> <that is. laughs> but I will say that's something I was super proud of in 20. You know, mm -hmm. We trumpeted the message with the with the pulpit that we have. It. I mean, it was the year really they put the truck driver at the front. Yes. Whether it was in April stocking the shelves, whether it was you know over the summer just kind of just fueling this incredible consumer driven demand. Okay. Um, but you think about like the. I mean, they, the TAs and the, all the uh, truck stops were shut down along that corridor. You couldn't get a hot shower. No. You know, you were laying down on the side of the road hoping, you know, you just you know, lines for, for gas. And it's, yeah. it made it challenging for our guys in the middle of a move where they had to stop because of uh, driver related rules yeah. and they couldn't find a place to go. Yeah. Our recruiting manager, Anna Almer, I mean, she really rose to the occasion. She put goodie bags together mm -hmm. and sent them out to everybody and had them. If you come through our facility, we got it here. And there was food in there. There was hand sanitizer and gloves and masks and the whole nine yards. And then we also invested in our facility that we put a new driver's lounge in, washer dryer, showers, TV, connectivity to the computers. Yeah. So anybody that comes through, we want you to feel welcome and be there in a safe environment. We saw a lot of shippers do that. A lot of big blue chip yeah. shippers were putting in like um, contactless goodie bag areas at their docks where drivers can go and get, yeah. you know, um, a couple Snickers, you know, whatever Absolutely. it was, a soda and a couple Snicker bars and a nice little package and, and you know, take it with them because you don't have that dock. If you're only in interactions with the dock workers at pickup and delivery when you're away from your families and you lose that, it, you know, it's an already isolation driven job. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, that's awesome that you guys are. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to see them get the appreciation. It this. is because a lot of times, you know, from an outsider looking in, a lot of people give the connotation of transportation as being a dirty industry. And I got to tell you, these drivers, they are absolute professionals because without them, we wouldn't have a lot, of, you know, 80% of the goods that we purchase are from a truck driver moving that stuff. So they do a phenomenal job. My hat goes off to them for what they've done, not only just this year, but all the years in the past. They make our you know entire country move forward. So thank you to the driver. I have these conversations all the time with like the analytics uh, journals or publications or just like the general business media. And we're talking about trucking and it's like, yeah, I mean, you got to think about the fact that these folks, they, they stake out for weeks or even months at a time. That's right. And they're bouncing around from location to location. And, you know, we've seen if you're tied to like a chicken uh, shipper, right, and those shut down and you don't have your head haul anymore, you're sort of stuck. Mm -hmm. So you, you're, you're maybe coming to us, which has been a great year for us to connect. You're coming to us to find freight, and it's just been a really cool year to connect with those folks. Sure. Excellent. Um, so I want to wrap things up. This has been an awesome discussion. Um, with one last 
piece, which is if, if a customer is looking to ship something, mm -hmm. um, if they have kind of a special request, or if a driver is looking to get a hold of you guys um, to lease on or come on as an employee driver, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah. So uh, our website is millertransfer.com, of course, and uh, we tried to, uh, probably two years ago, we revamped it to make it easier to communicate back and forth. So by putting in your zip code, if you're a customer and, and you put in your zip code, it'll automatically return the contact information for the region that serves you. Um, if you have a quote request, you can call them directly. Our teams are there to to handle your business, um, or you can actually fill out a, a form and it goes directly to the people that would handle that quote. Yeah. And then from a driver standpoint, certainly you can go to our website, as Dave mentioned, millertransfer.com, and there's a segment on there that you can go in for drivers. Also, highly encourage if they you know want to pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. Anna Almer is our recruiting manager, and she is phenomenal. 330-578-6104. Came prepared. And she gets it done. I will tell you, she is phenomenal at what she does. She will answer every single question that you have, and uh, she, she leaves no stone unturned. And again, it's not a, it's not a fit for everybody. But she's going to make sure just as much as we're interviewing somebody coming on board, we want them to interview us to make sure it's a right fit. Mm -hmm. And that she's phenomenal at her job. All right. Well, thanks again, guys. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I'm going to put these guys on the spot. And if you guys have any questions, you can send them over to askiq at DAT.com. Um, I'll get them over to Jason and David. Um, and maybe they can have a specialist on their team. If there's anything we didn't cover, get that answered for you. But again, thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you next time.